and you guys can start whenever. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, it's still morning. Uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to join you all and present some of our research data um, and experiences from what we've heard of uh, with students, parents across the state. Uh, today, we'll be sharing some of our content and research from our Crisis to Opportunity campaign, where we talk about how to center students' experiences to and through their educational career. Um, and this is particularly special uh, and needed during the times we're living through today. Uh, so I will pause right there and allow ourselves to introduce our, ourselves. And, and Dr. Ramirez, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Manny. Um, so my name is uh, Carolina or Carolina. Um, I go by either, and I want to start uh, just sharing a little bit about my own background. I'm a first-generation college student, and I'm also a proud product of uh, California public education. Um, my role with Education Trust West is uh, I'm a research and data analyst, and I support our uh, research and data efforts. Um, and uh, this work, my work there centers at the intersections of early childhood learning uh, and higher education. Prior to joining the Education Trust West, I work with the California Education Lab um, as a graduate student, and that's uh, based at UC Davis and um, centers on connecting research to education policy issues. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you all today about uh, how we center student experience and student voice uh, in our research, uh, sorry, in our advocacy and our, our policy efforts. Awesome. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, myself, my name is Manny Rodriguez. I am the Senior Legislative Associate at the Education Trust West. Been here for about uh, five, five years, four years, four or five, four years. Um, uh, pr prior to this, I was doing the Capital Fellows Program. Uh, I am originally from San Diego. Uh, I too am a first generation uh, student here in the US, or actually the oldest on the US side from my family. Uh, so I've been through uh, uh, quite the educational journey uh, from growing up in San Diego, going to Sonoma State, um, and just learning how to be um, an advocate in many ways. So uh, very excited to be here with you all and we'll get started. Next, yeah, awesome. So uh, before we get started, just wanna share a little bit about who ETW is. So Ed Trust West is an educational a nonprofit ed, uh, equity organization focused on educational justice and closing opportunity gaps through research data, policy analysis and advocacy. Uh, well, some of our big areas we look to influence change through are changing policy, changing practice, changing narrative. Um, we work from the early child care education space through higher education, um, and we have a very uh, focus, a, a big focus on racial equity, educational justice uh, for uh, students in our education system. Um. So just want to overview today's presentation. Um, welcome again to everybody. And uh, I don't think we noted this at the top, at the top but if you have comments um, or questions, please do uh, direct them in the chat and we will be, I'll be monitoring and um, uh, we'll be having time at the end of each section and then also at the end of the presentation um, to get through those. Um, so as Manny shared, we're going to be sharing our crisis uh, from crisis to opportunity work that came out of the uh, uh, distance learning and, and pandemic um, crises, uh, and then also sharing sharing the Hear My Voice um, study, which we ran uh, shortly before um, shortly before the school closures, and then finally we want to um, share some ways that folks can get involved. Thank you, Carolina. So 
this principle up here that we're, we're showing is, is something that we believe should hold weight uh, throughout our education system. And that is that all decisions should be made uh, through an equity lens. You know, uh, when making a decision, how will this impact the students who have uh, the most promise yet have been uh, historically underserved or unserved in, in some cases? So as ETW thought through, uh, you know, one got adjusted to uh, the radical change that came in March and thought through how do we maneuver this crisis um, into, uh, you know, opportunity to still have equity focused, student focused conversations and how to advance that. Uh, we outlined three primary themes as you, as you can see above. Uh, so the first being that we need strong leadership from the top while also uh, balancing local decision making and allowing those at the local level who are closest to students, to families, uh, to have some flexibility. Uh, what resources uh, should be targeted, prioritized to communities who were already underserved uh, and facing and are now facing more challenges uh, since this pandemic is, is exacerbating those from what we've heard from the field, from students through our polls and through countless polls we've heard. And lastly, the decisions we make during this crisis should continue our movement towards the dismantling of inequitable systems. Next slide, please. Thank you. So early on, we aim to operate, operationalize the, these previous principles uh, in, in two ways. Those were uh, centering student, family, and practitioner voices uh, and uplifting the stories of at promise student groups. Um, just, you know, despite the many well-intentioned efforts of educators at all levels, um, it was clear that distance learning experiences have varied dramatically across districts, schools, families, students, uh, and the conditions in which distance learning has occurred have been disproportionately uh, negatively impacted to the very students who are already most underserved in our system. Um, again, just really exacerbating some of those systemic inequities we knew already existed. Uh, and the second one was, you know, disruption presents us an opening again to rebuild those systems with equity at its center. Next slide, please. And finally, we found and, and heard that there were a, a few key challenges uh, as we engaged in this work and kind of uh, sought out to do research, talk to folks, talk to the field. Uh, and some of those, those key equity challenges were, you know, social emotional wellness. Um, how do we make sure that our students are uh, healthy enough to learn and um, have other non-academic uh, needs met because that really influences uh, any type of uh, academic uh, learning they'll do. Uh, the second, digital equity. We know that the digital divide was already present uh, prior to COVID, but now devices, broadband are critical um, when it comes to learning, uh, telehealth, teleworking, um, and, and we need to do more there because gaps are growing. Uh, third, family and educator engagement. How do we engage and connect with families and educators in this time to make sure that we have uh, effective learning? Uh, and fourth, how do we support our families to thrive uh, in this new env environment? So making sure that families are supported uh, during this distance learning environment. And again, uh, one of those principles that we, throughout this process, throughout this uh, time has, has been that no student should be punished for a crisis that is out of their control, beyond their control. Uh, and we need to meet them where they're at to make sure that uh, they have all the support resources um, needed to make sure that they can uh, effectively move through this. Uh, so what are our education equity recommendations coming from uh, the research, uh, the surveys, polling, uh, everything we've done uh, from the from crisis to opportunity campaign? Um, so the 
primary ones are, are two of the main ones that I want to uh, ac kind of acknowledge here are support to address academic needs. You know, um, how do we expedite and make sure that uh, we support the transition of services such as mental health, tutoring, advising into a remote or digital world? Um, how do we measure the digital divide and find both short-term and long-term ways to address this gap? Um, and how do we, you know, use that to re-engage students? Um, we need to have clear lines of communication between administrators, faculty, staff, students, and families uh, to make sure that they're all uh, working in a uh, effective uh, education ecosystem. Um, and lastly, how do we develop a robust distance learning plan which engages students where they're at and make sure that we can support them based on what they're going through right now. The second set of recommendations that we wanted to elevate and we're, we're working towards is supporting uh, support to address financial needs. Uh, so what this means is outside of just educational uh, challenges and, and gaps that they're facing, we know that uh, many of these students, many of these families are also experiencing uh, basic needs and security. So uh, food and housing insecurities. So how do we invest in those support services, whether that is food pantries, whether that is um, kind of uh, picking up lunches from school, uh, the pandemic EBT program, PEBT ran by the Department of Social Services. Um, how do we partner with community-based organizations to provide these resources and services again to make sure that we're meeting the most kind of basic of needs so that they can attempt to be ready just to learn. Um, thank you, Manny. Uh, so now I want us to pivot to the Hear My Voice study, which <clears throat> took a little bit of a deeper dive um, to into a couple groups of students. And um, I think this kind of a uh, couple of things that I wanted to highlight. Um, one is that um, something that probably won't be a surprise to the folks in the room, but um, uh, these student populations face um, multiple marginalized identities, and these all impact um, their ability to access uh, education across um, across the sectors, and is certainly into higher education and the retention. And um, so, part of part of how we uh, go about our work is to uh, um, re elevate these concerns and really um, we want to do it from um, the student voice themselves, the students actually naming, students, families, and other stakeholders actually naming what their needs are um, and how uh, education systems can better support them. Okay. Um, so this uh, study was a part of a larger study of uh, CSU students. We collected our data uh, in spring and summer of 2019. Um, these were mostly interviews done on campus, um, on the various uh, campuses that folks attended. We also had some um, on the phone. Um, and I will uh, let participants speak. We have some audio. I'll let participants speak for themselves in a little bit. <clears throat> a little bit of context. Um, so these populations are really uh, ubiquitous and they've been um, a part of the student population for a long time. At the same time, it's they're not centered in in um, in the classroom um, in the way that you know classrooms are structured and the types of things the types of um, expectations that professors may have for their students, um, nor in the wider uh, campus community. Um, Twelve percent of undergraduates at the CSU are unhoused, and uh, nearly a quarter of California's undergraduates are parents. Um, and so, the CSU recently launched the graduation initiative, uh, 2025, and we saw this as an opportunity to push the CSU um, to uh, really focus on um, not only all students, but um, really drill down and, and provide some specific supports for um, student parents and unhoused parents, unhoused students. 
Okay, uh, so I'll play some audio for us. What help they need in order to succeed. So I ended up double majoring. It was a really tough decision. Okay. Here. I am actually the first out of my three siblings to attend college and graduate from high school. So I feel in a sense this is a new cycle that um, I want to pass on to to my daughter and my nephews and my niece along the way. And I just feel like we're, there's a ton of us there and all of us kind of just like walk around and like I feel like no no one really knows each other's stories or like the school doesn't really know anything about their students. They just admit them and in my eyes I feel like it's more just like of a money making thing rather than getting to know who their students are and where they come from and what struggles they've faced or what help they need in order to succeed. So I ended up double majoring. It was a really tough decision between do I want to get out of here and just find a job? Or do I really want to pursue my passion and find something for me as an individual, right? Because I'm a parent and I want to be the best parent and I want to provide financially for my child. But at the same time, at an individual level, I want to grow. I want to really fulfill all my educational goals, dreams. Um, a little more about um, the uh, criteria that we used for uh, the inclusion criteria we used for the study. Um, so folks were between the ages of um, 18 and 40 for unhoused students and 18 and 50 uh, for parents. Um, and they had to be unhoused at the time of the interview. It is, I know it's a moving target, but that's, that's the framework that we used for the study. Um, and primary takers, primary caretakers for at least uh, one child um, under the age of 14 um, at the time of the study. I am actually the first out of my three Whoa. siblings to attend getting to. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, let me move to our research questions. <clears throat> so um, we were getting back to kind of this idea that folks are facing um, multiple multiple identities and um, can be marginalized in different ways. We really wanted to focus on um, folks' motivation and their um, dedication to pursuing a degree. Um, we were, you know, we just wanted to know what keeps folks going uh, personally. And then the second research question is what kinds of resources are available to them, um, what institutional resources at the campus system or um, community level um, that were helping them stay connected to school. Uh, and so here are some of our findings. Um, so uh, more support is needed that specifically addresses housing and childcare needs. Um, so, to that point, we some many of the campus many of the campuses did offer childcare, but the they are not specifically meant for students. They're available to the community and staff and and faculty members, um, and they have long wait lists. Uh, and private care private care in the community is uh, was prohibitively expensive for lots of folks. So often this led to a situation where student parents uh, might have um, care for class time, but not care for um, study time. So they were completing assignments and um, taking tests at home um, while also simultaneously caring for children. Uh, and I will play a short audio clip um, that helps illustrate what this experience is like. I actually asked, can we have evening daycare or, you know, late daycare because daycare ends at five. He's like, yeah, it's just that it's, it's harder because there's a lot of policies and ethical issues and all this stuff. And I was like, okay, well, I always thought I'm like, but it's possible. It might just be too expensive for you all. Meaning that at this point you're picking and choosing which students you want to help the most because on one I had a little I guess trouble like with their child's care 
because they don't live in accept him because he has autism. So um, the first they have said they couldn't accept him because they didn't have the staff, and then they said they're gonna call me back. And I tried for two years, and they would just, he would just never get in. So it was really hard, like, to come to school. And then at first, I was community. Last time I checked, I believe there was a wait list for it. So that mm-hmm. kind of discouraged me from even trying it out because I wasn't sure how long that wait list was going to be there for. And when you need a child care provider or, like, just child care um, for your child, it's because you kind of need it urgently it's not something that you could just wait on what we came up with it's uh providing free diapers for any student in the children's closet okay um and related to have evening day okay um so uh related to uh housing services um services might be available were available on many of the campuses um, but these were uh, poorly advertised and uh, more more importantly to students um, they were often too limited so um, although we were looking at student parents and unhoused students separately um, some of our unhoused students also had children and, and couldn't access housing because um, because they needed a ha- family housing or um, housing support services were uh, maybe a week or two and they just felt like they wouldn't be able to resolve their housing uh, issues in that span of time. It's been like a roller coaster. Like I think I've lived like five, six different places within his last five years. Mm-hmm. So it's very, you know, like inconsistent mm-hmm. and it does make everything like feel a lot heavier mm-hmm. just because, you know, like you're still trying to find a stable place to be at, to just know that you're secure there and not having that like adds a lot of stress. It's been. Okay. Uh, and then another th- another theme we found is um, the stigma and the lack of visibility for these two populations. Um, so for student parents, um, faculty members didn't account for the fact that their students might have um, caretaker responsibilities. Uh, so, you know, you still had, they were there. The students were still um, held to the same kind of um, attendance policies that another student without caretaker responsibility was held to. Um, And there was just little clarity about whether they could bring um, kids on campus or or into the class, uh, which would have um, sort of alleviated some of the last minute or um, uh, some of the gaps in childcare. Um, And unhoused students, um, one of the things that they named was that professors assumed that they would have access to the technology and workspace uh, to complete their work, you know, once campus closed. And that wasn't the case for many of the folks we spoke to, like they had to be um, in the library or on campus in order to be able to access technology and and, technology. the the technology and just kind of a quiet space. Um, And the women we spoke to were reluctant to disclose their identities. Um, They were um, sort of aware of these kind of negative stereotypes associated with um, being unhoused or or being a student parent. And and they were afraid that they would be uh, thought of as less dedicated um, students. Um, Another thing that came out is <clears throat> part of what was driving uh, the burden, the cost burden um, of attending college and staying in college was not related to tuition at all, but reflected um, the house to f- the the cost of housing in California and also the cost of raising a family. Uh, and the women we spoke to were employed in uh, low paying or minimum wage jobs with variable hours and that that put them in the position of having to decide, do I, you know, do overtime so I can cover my 
family and my own living expenses, or do I um, prioritize school and and take out loans or have some sort of a um, have to make kind of big adjustments in my uh, basic living um, uh, security? Um, so relatedly, um, although we did, we expected to find housing insecurity and other basic needs and security, we were surprised um, with the degree to which our participants um, face food insecurity and base and, and housing insecurity. Um, and they showed that they were often most easily able to access food security resources on campus. Um, and, but as far as having some of their other needs met, it involved a lot of self-advocacy, a lot of um, time kind of searching around, a lot of tapping into their own personal networks in order to um, be able to access uh, things like um, public benefits from the county. Alrighty. Thank you, Carolina, for that uh, overview of the report. Um, and we hope that some of that data, research, and student experiences uh, speak to some of you and the students you engage with on a daily basis uh, as they move through the into the post-secondary institutions. Uh, with this report, of course, we have some key recommendations for policymakers and for um, institution leaders on how to support, uh, best support uh, these students. Uh, so the first one is improve and increase access to existing resources targeting uh, parenting and unhoused students. So two things I just want to elevate here is, is that the first, uh, in, in this research, we found that 18 of 23 CSU campuses uh, did have uh, child care centers, two of which are affiliated with Head Start. Uh, but due to some data limitations, it was unclear how many CSU parents were currently being served uh, by those on-campus child care. Uh, we estimated uh, through, through some work that meeting the needs of student parents with children under the age of six years old uh, would require the CSU to have capacity for a, a, about uh, 27, 28,000 children. Um, so one of the ways they can do that is, is really um, making sure that the CSU partners with Head Start uh, to expand access. Uh, another thing I'll point out is that uh, the Success for Homeless Youth and Higher Education Act requires the CSU campuses to designate some sort of financial aid staff member to serve as the homeless and foster youth uh, liaison who can connect students with campus, state, local, federal, resources. Uh, we recommend that this be a standalone position for these students and that this liaison uh, really be dedicated full time to make sure that, um, that there's those resources are readily accessible. Uh, so the next uh, set of recommendations is across expanding uh, access to resources to address non-tuition costs. So when we, uh, when our institutions and policymakers are, are considering budgets uh, and making, we really want them to make sure that they center the experiences, challenges, and, and the needs that our uh, students face. Uh, by 2025, the CSU uh, should set a, a goal where they ensure that all parenting students uh, have a financial aid package that accounts for uh, their dependent dependents. Um, this is uh, something very important as California once again aims to reform the financial aid system in this coming legislative session. Uh, and the third one, of course, by 2025, we really hope that the CSU uh, builds out sufficient housing units to house 20% uh, of their student body. Uh, in addition, uh, we really hope the system should uh, provide guidance to campuses on how to prioritize making those new units available to uh, our students that are, are facing the most um, housing, housing insecurity. Uh, 
Finally, uh, the final recommendation is around how do we use data to impro improve services uh, for parenting and unhoused students. Uh, so we do have an audio we'll play shortly. There you go. One, I feel like there's a lack of data. I don't think anybody has really put the effort to collect um, numbers to really figure out, like, you know, what, what is the population of student parents is in whether it's community college or, um, you know, higher education. We look at the grades and why there's a lot of, like, 50% of the class fails or why 20% only gets A's or, like, certain like, percent of grades. But like actually go in depth and be like, okay, but what's the problem of this? Like, what's the reason why? Is it the students? Is it the teachers? Is it the way they're being taught? Is it the way it's being presented? Like, why aren't the students graduating at a four or five year rate instead of a six, eight rate? They have to like, do more studies and research on, or what are we missing to tell these students to, you know, like make the process smoother? Totally. So, you know, at the, at ETW, we, we're... One, I feel like there's a lack of data. I don't think anybody has... We're firm believers in data, uh, and, and we really think that you can't solve a problem if we can't wrap our arms around it or can't see it. So um, this data piece is really important. So one approach we're highlighting as a promising practice or something that should be considered is coming from the community college system in which enrolling students are asked to self-identify as unhoused. Uh, while that is kind of self-identification, um, you know, that is one way we can start moving in this direction where we can, again, just highlight and know um, where our students are coming from, their experiences, so we can begin building out those support services for them. So finally, we want to um, invite folks to check out our report um, and the accompanying materials and uh, join us. Um, we have been engaged in a camp in an advocacy campaign at the CSU with the CFCU's Board of Trustees. Um, we really want to be able to um, elevate the findings and the recommendations in this report um, to the system and um, have some change uh, that isn't just, you know, um, based on the uh, willingness of, of a campus leader. Um, and uh, so we can invite folks who are uh, interested in partnering with us to definitely reach out. Um, and I'll, I'll show our contact information shortly. Um, but finally, I want to uh, invite us to take some time to uh, think through this question um, that we have on the slide um, and share out in the chat. Um, and I also want to know, I didn't um, invite folks to ask questions. I'm, I'm monitoring the chat and we haven't had anything come through. So this is definitely uh, the time to ask any questions you might have. I'm going to give it another minute. Um, well, I will share our uh, Manny and Mai's contact information. Um, um, we just want to thank you all for joining us uh, in this conversation today, and we hope that this uh, information was helpful to you and that you can um, take this back to your uh, organizations and your communities.